Chapter Twelve of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter Twelve. Colonel Kip. As soon as I had swallowed supper, I hastened to place myself en rapport with the landlord of the hostelry, whose name I had ascertained to be Kip, or Colonel Kip, as his guests called him. Though I had no intention of proceeding farther that night, I was desirous of obtaining some information about the whereabouts of my new estate, with such other facts in relation to it as might be collected in Swampville. The landlord would be the most likely person to give me the desired intelligence this distinguished individual i encountered soon after in the veranda seated upon a rawhide rocking-chair with his feet elevated some six inches above the level of his nose and resting across the balustrade of the railing beyond which his huge horse-skin boots protruded a full half-yard into the street but that i had been already made aware of the fact i should have had some difficulty in reconciling the portentous title of colonel with the exceedingly unmilitary-looking personage before me a tall lopsided tobacco-chewer who at short intervals of about half a minute each projected the juice in copious squirts into the street sending it clean over the toes of his boots when i first set eyes upon the colonel he was in the centre of a circle of toothpickers who had just issued from the supper-room these were falling off one by one and noticing their defection i waited for an opportunity to speak to the colonel alone this after a short time offered itself the dignified gentleman took not the slightest notice of me as i approached nor until i had got so near as to leave no doubt upon his mind that a conversation was intended then edging slightly round and drawing in the boots he made a half face towards me still however keeping fast to his chair the army sir i presume interrogatively began mr kipp no answered i imitating his laconism of speech no i have been in the service i have just left it oh ah from mexico then i presume yes business in swampville why yes mr kipp i am usually called colonel here interrupted the backwoods militario with a bland smile as if half deprecating the title and that it was forced upon him of course he continued you sir being a stranger i beg your pardon colonel kipp i am a stranger to your city and of course don't signify i don't sir interrupted he rather good-humouredly in return for the show of deference i had made and also perhaps for my politeness in having styled swampville a city business in swampville you say yes i replied and seeing it upon his lips to inquire the nature of my business which i did not wish to make known just then i forestalled him by the question do you chance to know such a place as holt's clearing chance to know such a place as holt's clearing yes holt's clearing well there air such a place is it distant if you mean hick holt's clearing it's a leetle better'n six miles from here he squats on mud creek there's a squatter upon it then on holt's clearing well i should rather say there air a squatter on it and no mistake his name is holt is it not that same individual do you think i could procure a guide in swampville someone who could show me the way to holt's clearing do i think so possible you might do you uh, see that ar case in the coon cat the speaker looked rather than pointed to the young fellow of the buckskin shirt who outside the veranda was now standing by the side of a very sorry-looking steed i replied in the affirmative well i reckon he can show you the way to holt's clearin he's another of them mud creek squatters he just catchin up his critter to go that way this i hailed as a fortunate circumstance if the young hunter lived near the clearing i was in search of perhaps he could give me all the information i required and his frank open countenance led me to believe that he would not withhold it it occurred to me therefore to make a slight change in my programme it was yet early for supper in the backwoods is what is elsewhere known as tea the sun was still an hour or so above the horizon my horse had made a light journey and nine miles more would be nothing to him all at once then i altered my intention of sleeping at the hotel and determined if the young hunter would accept me 
as a travelling companion to proceed along with him to mud creek whether i should find a bed there never entered into my calculation i had my great-sleeved coat strapped upon the cantle of my saddle and with that for covering and the saddle itself for a pillow i had made shift on many a night more tempestuous than that promised to be i was about turning away to speak to the young man when i was recalled by an exclamation from the landlord i guess said he in a half bantering way you hain't told me your business yet no i answered deferentially i have not what on air's taken you to holt's clarin that mr kipp i beg your pardon colonel kipp is a private matter private and particular eh very oh then i guess you'd better keep it to yourself that is precisely my intention i rejoined turning on my heel and stepping out of the veranda the young hunter was just buckling the girth of his saddle as i approached him i saw that he was smiling he had overheard the concluding part of the conversation and looked as if pleased at the way in which i had bantered the colonel who as i afterwards learnt from him was the grand swaggerer of swampville a word was sufficient he at once acceded to my request frankly if not in the most elegant phraseology i'd be pleased to show you the way to holt's clarin my own rule goes just that way to within a square jump of it thank you i shall not keep you waiting i re-entered the hotel to pay for my entertainment and give orders for the saddle of my horse it was evident that i had offended the landlord by my brusque behaviour i ascertained this by the amount of my bill as well as by the fact of being permitted to saddle for myself even the naked nigger did not make his appearance at the stable not much cared i i had drawn the girth too often to be disconcerted by such petty annoyance and in five minutes after i was in the saddle and ready for the road having joined my companion in the street we rode off from the inhospitable caravanserai of the jackson hotel leaving its warlike landlord to chew his tobacco and such reflections as my remarks had given rise to End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter thirteen through the forest as we passed up the street i was conscious of being the subject of swampville speculation staring faces at the windows and gaping groups around the doors proved by their looks and gestures that i was regarded as a rare spectacle it could scarcely be my companion who was the object of this universal curiosity a buckskin hunting shirt was an everyday sight in swampville not so a well-mounted military man armed uniformed and equipped no doubt my splendid arab caracoling as if he had not been out of the stable for a week came in for a large share of the admiration we were soon beyond its reach five minutes sufficed to carry us out of the sight of the swamp villians for in that short space of time we had cleared the suburbs of the city and were riding under the shadows of an unbroken forest its cold gloom gave instantaneous relief shading us at one and the same time from the fiery sun and the glances of vulgar observation through which we had run the gauntlet i at least enjoyed the change and for some minutes we rode silently on my guide keeping in advance of me this mode of progression was not voluntary but a necessity arising from the nature of the road which was a mere trace or bridle-path blazed across the forest no wheel had ever made its track in the soft deep mud into which at every step our steeds sank far above the fetlocks and as there was not room for two riders abreast i followed the injunction of my companion by keeping my horse's head at the tail o hisn in this fashion we progressed for a mile or more through a tract of what is termed bottom timber a forest of those gigantic water-loving trees the sycamore and cottonwood their tall grey trunks rose along the path standing thickly on each side and sometimes in regular rows like the columns of a granite temple i felt a secret satisfaction in gazing upon these colossal forms for my heart hailed them as the companions of my future solitude at the same time i could not help the reflection that if my new estate was thus heavily encumbered the clearing of the squatter was not likely to be extended beyond whatever limits the axe of mr holt had already assigned to it a little further on the path began to ascend 
we had passed out of the bottom lands and were crossing a ridge which forms the divide between mud creek and the obion river the soil was now a dry gravel with less signs of fertility and covered with a pine forest the trees were of slender growth and at intervals their trunks stood far apart giving us an opportunity to ride side by side this was exactly what i wanted as i was longing for a conversation with my new acquaintance up to this time he had observed a profound silence but for all that i fancied he was not disinclined to a little causerie his reserve seemed to spring from a sense of modest delicacy as if he did not desire to take the initiative i relieved him from this embarrassment by opening the dialogue what sort of a gentleman is this mr holt gentleman yes what sort of a person is he oh what sort of a person well stranger he's what we in these parts call a rough customer indeed rather i should say is he what you call a poor man all that i reckon he ain't got nothin as i knows on exceptin his old critter a uh, horse and his clarin a uh, couple of acres or thereabouts besides he only squats upon that he's only a squatter then that's all stranger though i reckon he considers a clarin as much his own as i do my own bit of ground that's been bought and paid for indeed yes i shouldn't like to be the party that would buy it over his head the speaker accompanied these words with a sufficient glance which seemed to say i wonder if that's his business here has he any family well, there's one a young critter or a girl that all i asked seeing that my companion hesitated as if he had something more to say but was backward about declaring it no stranger there war another girl older than this one. and she 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 gone away married i suppose that's what nobody about here can tell nor where she's gone neither the tone in which the young fellow spoke had suddenly altered from gay to grave and by a glimpse of the moonlight i could perceive that his countenance was shadowed and sombre i could have but little doubt as to the cause of this transformation it was to be found in the subject of our conversation the absent daughter of the squatter from motives of delicacy i refrained from pushing my inquiries further but indeed i should have been otherwise prevented from doing so for just at that moment the road once more narrowed and we were forced apart by the eager urging of his horse into the dark path i could perceive the hunter was desirous of terminating a dialogue to him in all probability suggestive of bitter memories for another half hour we rode on in silence my companion apparently buried in a reverie of thought myself speculating on the chances of an unpleasant encounter which from the hints i had just had was now rather certain than probable instead of a welcome from the squatter and a bed in the corner of his cabin i had before my mind the prospect of a wordy war and perhaps afterwards of spending my night in the woods once or twice i was on the point of proclaiming my errand and asking the young hunter for advice as how i should act but as i had not yet ascertained whether he was friend or foe of my future hypothetical antagonist i thought it more prudent to keep my secret to myself his voice again fell upon my ear this time in a more cheerful tone it was simply to say that i might shortly expect a better road we were approaching a glebe beyond that a trace war wider and we might ride together again we were just entering the glade as he finished speaking and opening in the woods of limited extent the contrast between it and the dark forest path we had traversed was striking as the change itself was pleasant it was like emerging suddenly from darkness into daylight for the full moon now soaring high above the spray of the forest filled the glade with the ample effulgence of her light the dew-besprinkled flowers were sparkling like gems and even though it was night their exquisite aroma had reached us afar off in the forest there was not a breath of air stirring and the unruffled leaves presented the sheen of shining metal under the clear moonlight i could distinguish the varied hues of the frondage that of the red maple from the scarlet sumacs and sassafras laurels and these again from the dark green of the carolina bay trees and the silvery foliage of the magnolia glauca even before entering the glade this magnificent panorama had burst upon my sight from a little embayment that formed the debouchure of the path and i had drawn bridle in order for a moment to enjoy its contemplation the young hunter was still the length of his horse in advance of me 
and I was about requesting him to pull up. But before I could give utterance to the words, I saw him make halt of himself. This, however, was done in so awkward and hurried a manner that I at once turned from gazing upon the scene and fixed my eyes upon my companion. As if by an involuntary effort he had drawn his horse almost up by his haunches and was now stiffly seated in the saddle, with blanched cheeks and eyes sparkling in their sockets, as if some object of terror was before him. I did not ask for an explanation. I knew that the object that so strangely affected him must be visible, though not from the point where I had halted. A touch of the spur brought my horse alongside his and gave me a view of the whole surface of the glade. I looked in the direction indicated by the attitude of the hunter, for, apparently paralyzed by some terrible surprise, he had neither pointed nor spoken. A little to the right of the path I beheld a white object lying along the ground, a dead tree whose barkless trunk and smooth naked branches gleamed under the moonlight with the whiteness of a blanched skeleton. In front of this, and a pace or two from it, was a dark form, upright and human-like. Favoured by the clear light of the moon, I had no difficulty in distinguishing the form to be that of a woman. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 14 Suwanee. Beyond doubt, the dark form was that of a woman. A young one, too, as evinced by her erect bearing and a light agile movement made at the moment of our first beholding her her attire was odd it consisted of a brownish coloured tunic apparently of doeskin leather reaching from the neck to the knees underneath which appeared leggings of like material ending in moccasins that covered the feet the arms neck and head were entirely bare and the colour of the skin as seen in the moonlight differed from that of the outer garments only in being a shade or two darker the woman therefore was not white but an indian and was made further manifest by the sparkling of beads and bangles around her neck rings in her ears and metal circlets upon her arms all reflecting the light of the moon in copious coruscations as i brought my horse to a halt i perceived that the figure was advancing towards us and with rapid step my steed set his ears and snorted with affright the jade of the hunter had already given the example each no doubt acting under the impulse of the rider mine was a feeling of simple astonishment such an apparition in that place and at that hour was sufficient cause for surprise but a more definite reason was my observing that a different emotion had been roused in the breast of the young hunter his looks betrayed fear rather than surprise fear of what i asked myself as the figure advanced and still more emphatically as it came near enough to enable me to make out the face as far as the moonlight would permit me to judge there was nothing in that face to fray either man or horse, certainly nothing to create an emotion such as was depicted in the countenance of my companion. The complexion was brown, as already observed, but the features, if not of the finest type, were yet comely enough to attract admiration, and they were lit up by a pair of eyes whose liquid glance rivalled the sheen of the golden pendant sparkling on each side of them. I should have been truly astonished at the behaviour of my guide, but for the natural reflection that there was some cause for it yet unknown to me evidently it was not his first interview with the forest maiden for i could now perceive that the person who approached was not exactly a woman but rather a well-grown girl on the eve of womanhood she was of large stature nevertheless with bold outline of breast and arms that gave token of something more than feminine strength in truth she appeared possessed of a physique sufficiently formidable to inspire a cowardly man with fear had such been her object but I could perceive no signs of menace in her manner. Neither could cowardice be an attribute of my travelling companion. There was an unexplained something, therefore, to account for his present display of emotion. On arriving within six paces of the heads of our horses, the Indian paused, as if hesitating to advance. Up to this time she had not spoken a word, neither had my companion, beyond a phrase or two that had involuntarily escaped him on first discovering her presence in the glade shall ye hear and at this time of night i had heard him mutter to himself but nothing more until the girl had stopped as described 
then in a low voice and with a slightly trembling accent he pronounced interrogatively the words suwanee it was the name of the indian maiden but there was no reply suwanee repeated he in a louder tone is it you the answer was also given interrogatively has the white eagle lost his eyes by gazing too long on the pale-faced fair ones of swampville there is light in the sky and the face of suwanee is turned to it let him look on it it is not lovely like that of the half-blood but the white eagle will never see that face again this declaration had a visible effect on the young hunter the shade of sadness deepened upon his features and i could hear a sigh with difficulty suppressed while at the same time he appeared desirous of terminating the interview it's late girl rejoined he after a pause what for are ye here suwanee is here for a purpose for hours she has been waiting to see the white eagle the soft hands of the pale-faced maidens have held him long waiting to see me what do you want with me let the white eagle send the stranger aside suwanee must speak to him alone there's no need of that it's a friend that's with me would the white eagle have his secrets known there are some he may not wish even a friend to hear suwanee can tell him one that will crimson his cheeks like the flowers of the red maple i have no secrets girl none as if i'm afraid of being heard by anybody what of the half-blood i don't care to hear of her the white eagle speaks falsely he does care to hear he longs to know what has become of his lost marion suwanee can tell him the last words produced an instantaneous change in the bearing of the young hunter instead of the repelling attitude he had hitherto observed toward the indian girl i saw him bend eagerly forward as if desirous of hearing what she had to say seeing that she had drawn his attention the indian again pointed to me and inquired is the pale-faced stranger to know the love secrets of the white eagle i saw that my companion no longer desired me to be a listener without waiting for his reply i drew my horse's head in the opposite direction and was riding away in the turning i came face to face with him and by the moonlight shining full over his countenance i fancied i could detect some traces of mistrust still lingering upon it my fancy was not at fault for on brushing close past him he leaned over towards me and in an earnest manner muttered please stranger don't go fur there's danger in this girl she's been arter me before i nodded assent to his request and turning back into the little bay that formed the embouchure of the path i pulled up under the shadow of the trees at this point i was not ten paces from the hunter and could see him but a little clump of white magnolias prevented me from seeing the girl at the same time that it hid both myself and the horse from her sight the chirrup of the cicadas alone hindered me from hearing all of what was said but many words reached my ear and with sufficient distinctness to give me a clue to the subject of the promised revelation delicacy would have prompted me to retire a little further off but the singular caution i had received from my companion prevented me from obeying its impulse i could make out that a certain marion was the subject of the conversation and then more distinctively that it was marion holt just as i expected the daughter of my squatter that other and older one of whom mention had been already made this part of the revelation was easily understood since i was already better than half prepared for it equally easy of comprehension was the fact that this marion was the sweetheart of my travelling companion had been i should rather say for from what followed i could gather that she was no longer in the neighbourhood that some months before she had left it or been carried away spirited off in some mysterious manner leaving no traces of the why or whither she had gone nearly all this i had conjectured before since the young hunter had half revealed it to me by his manner if not by words now however a point or two was added to my previous information relating to the fair marion she was married married and to some odd sort of man of whom the indian appeared to be speaking slightingly his name i could make out to be stevens or stevens or something of the sort not very intelligible by the indian's mode of pronouncing it and furthermore that he had been a schoolmaster in swampville during the progress of the dialogue i had my eye fixed on the young hunter i could perceive that the announcement of the marriage was quite new to him and its effect was as that of a sudden blow of course equally unknown to him had been the name of the husband though from the exclamatory phrase that followed he had no doubt had his conjectures oh god he exclaimed 
i thought so a very man to a done it lord a mercy on her all this was uttered with a voice hoarse with emotion tell me continued he where are they gone you say you know the shrill screech of a tree cricket breaking forth at that moment hindered me from hearing the reply the more emphatic words only reached me and these appeared to be utah and great salt lake they were enough to fix the whereabouts of marian holt and her husband one question more said the rejected lover hesitatingly as if afraid to ask it can you tell me whether she went willingly or whether there wants some force used by her father or some one else can you tell me that girl i listened eagerly for the response its importance can be easily understood by one who has sued in vain one who has wooed without winning the silence of the cicada favoured me but a long interval passed and there came not a word from the lips of the indian answer me suwanee repeated the young man in a more appealing tone tell me that and i promise will the white eagle promise to forget his lost love will he promise no suwanee i cannot promise that i can never forget her the heart can hate without forgetting hate her hate marian no no not if she be false how do i know that she were false you haven't told me whether she went willingly or against her consent the white eagle shall know then his gentle doe went willingly to the covert of the wolf willingly i repeat suwanee can give proof of her words this was the most terrible stroke of all i could see the hunter shrink in his saddle a death-like pallor overspreading his cheeks while his eyes presented the glassy aspect of despair now continued the indian as if taking advantage of the blow she had struck will the white eagle promise to sigh no more after his false mistress will he promise to love one that can be true there was an earnestness in the tone in which these interrogatories were uttered an appealing earnestness evidently prompted by a burning headlong passion it was now the turn of her who uttered them to wait with anxiety for a response it came at length perhaps to the laceration of that proud heart for it was a negative to its dearest desire no no exclaimed the hunter confusedly impossible either to hate or forget her she may have been false and no doubt are so but it's too late for me i can never love again a half-suppressed scream followed this declaration succeeded by some words that appeared to be uttered in a tone of menace or reproach but the words were in the chickasaw tongue and i could not comprehend their import almost at the same instant i saw the young hunter hurriedly draw back his horse as if to get out of the way i fancied that the crisis had arrived when my presence might be required under this belief i touched my steed with the spur and trotted out into the open ground to my astonishment i perceived that the hunter was alone suwanee had disappeared from the glade End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter Fifteen. Making a Clean Breast of It. Where is she? Gone? I mechanically asked in a tone that must have betrayed my surprise yes gone gone I'm a mormon a mormon ay stranger a mormon a man with twenty wives go forgive her i'd rather hear to her death was there a man with her i saw no one oh stranger excuse my talk you're thinking of that air injun girl tain't her i'm speaking about who then the young hunter hesitated he was not aware that i was already in possession of his secret but he knew that i had been witness of his emotions and to declare the name would be to reveal the most sacred thought of his heart only for a moment did he appear to reflect and then as if relieved from his embarrassment by some sudden determination he replied stranger i don't see why i shouldn't tell you about this business i don't know the reason but you made me feel kind of confidence in you i know it's a silly sort of thing to fall in love with a handsome girl 
but if you had only seen her i have no doubt from what you say she was a beautiful creature this was scarcely my thought at the moment and as for falling in love with a pretty girl none of us are exempt from that little weakness the proud roman conqueror yielded to the seductions of the brown-skinned egyptian queen and even hercules himself was conquered by a woman's charms there is no particular silliness in that it is but the common destiny of man well stranger it's been mine and i've had reason to be sorry for it but it's no use trying to shed up the stable arter the hoss has been stole out of sheer gone now on that seeing it i reckon i never set eyes on her again the sigh that accompanied this last observation with the melancholy tone in which it was uttered told me that i was talking to a man who had truly loved no doubt thought i some strapping backwoods wench has been the object of his passion for what other idea could i have about the child of a coarse and illiterate squatter love is as blind as a bat and this red-haired hoyden has appeared a perfect venus in the eyes of the handsome fellow as not unfrequently happens a venus with evidently a slight admixture of the prudential juno in her composition the young backwoodsman is poor the schoolmaster perhaps a little better off in all probability not much but enough to decide the preference of the shrewd marion such were my reflections at the moment partly suggested by my own experience but you have not yet told me who this sweetheart was you say it is not the indian damsel you've just parted with no stranger nothing of the kind though there are some injun in her too twere her the girl spoke when you heard her talk a half-blood she ain't just that she's more white than injun her mother only war a half-blood of the chickasaw nation that used to belong in these parts her name it war marion hope it are now stebbins i suppose since i've just heard she's married to a fellow o that name she has certainly not improved her name she air the daughter o hope the squatter the same war you say you're a-goin there's another as i told you but she's a younger un her name's lillian a pretty name the older sister was very beautiful you say i never set eyes on the like o her does the younger one resemble her ain't a bit like her different as a squirrel from a coon she's more beautiful then well that depends on people's ways of thinking most people as know em like lillian the best and thought her the handsomest of the two that wa'n't my notion besides lily's only a young critter not out of her teens yet but if she be also pretty why not try to fall in love with her down in mexico where i've been lately they have a shrewd saying un clavo saca otro clavo meaning that one nail drives out another as much as to say that one love cures another all oh, stranger that may be very well in mexico where i've heerd they ain't particular about their way of lovin but we've a sayin here jest the contrary to that two bars can't get into the same trap <laughs> well your backwards proverb is perhaps the truer one as it is the more honest but you have not yet told me the full particulars of your affair with marion you say she has gone away from the neighbourhood you shall hear it all stranger i reckon there can be no harm in tellin it to you and if you've a mind to listen i'll make a clean breast of the whole business the hunter proceeded with his revelation to him a painful one and although i had already divined most of the particulars i interrupted him only with an occasional interrogative the story was as i had anticipated he had been in love with marian holt and was under the impression that she returned it she had given him frequent meetings in the forest in that very glade where we had encountered the indian girl and in which we were still lingering her father was not aware of these interviews there had been some coolness between him and the young hunter and the lovers were apprehensive that he might not approve of their conduct this was the prologue of the hunter's story the epilogue i give in his own words twar a marnin just five months ago she had promised to meet me here and i war seated on yonder log waitin for her just then some injuns war comin to the glede that girl ye saw war one of em she had a nice bullet pouch to sell and i bought it the girl would insist on putting it on and while she were doing so i was fool enough to give her a kiss some devil had put it in my head just at that minute who should come right into the glee but marion herself i mean nothing by kissing the engine but i suppose marion thought i did 
she already talked to me about this very girl and i believe war a leetle bit jealous of her for the injun ain't to say ill lookin i want to apologize to marion but she wouldn't listen to a word and went off away i never seed her in before twar the last time i ever set eyes on her indeed ay stranger and it's only this minute and from that same injun girl that i've heard she's married and gone off to the moments the injuns had it from some of her people that seed marion across in the prairies that indian damsel suwanee i think you named her what of her oh stranger that's another or the kind of quenches a doin what ain't right since the day i gin her that kiss she nibber let me alone but used to bother me every time i met her in the woods and would a come ar to meet in my own cabin if it hadn't been for the dogs that would tar an injun to pieces she were afeard of them but not of me no matter how i threatened her i were so angry with her for what had happened though arter all twere more my fault than hern but i were so vexed with her about the ill luck that i used to keep out of her way as well as i could and didn't speak to her for a long time she got riled about that and threatened revenge and one night as i were a-comin from swampville about this time only twere as dark as a pot o pitch i were just ridin out into this very glede when all of a sudden my old hoss gin a jump forward and i feel something prick me from behind twere a stab of some sort of knife that cut me a little above the hip and made me bleed like a buck i knowed who did it though not that night for it was so dark among the bushes i couldn't see a stem but i came back in the morning and seed tracks they were the tracks of a moccasin i know them to be hern suwanee's tracks sartin i'd know em well enough as i'd often seed her tracks through the creek bottom did you take no steps to punish her well no i didn't how is that i think it would have been prudent of you to have done something if only to prevent a recurrence of the danger well stranger to tell the truth i war a little ashamed of the whole business had it been a man i'd a punished him but they do say the girl in love with me arter her injun way and i didn't like to be revengeful besides it war mostly my own fault i had no business to a fool with her and you think she will not trouble you again i don't know about that arter what's happened that night she'd gone away threatening again i did think she'd gin up the notion of revenge for she knowed i found out that twa her that stabbed me i told her so the next time i seed her and she appeared pleased about my not having her taken up she said it was generous of the white eagle that's a name her people guys me for there's a gang of them still living down the creek she gin me a sort of promise she wouldn't trouble me again but i warn't sure of her that's the reason stranger i didn't want you to go too far away i think it would be prudent in you to keep well on your guard this redskin appears to be rather an unreflecting damsel and from what you have told me a dangerous one she certainly has a strange way of showing her affection but it must be confessed you gave her some provocation and as the poet says hell knows no fury like a woman scorned what true stranger her conduct however has been too violent to admit of justification you appear to have been unfortunate in your sweethearts with each in an opposite sense one loves you too much and the other apparently not enough but how is it you did not see her again marion i mean well you understand i wa'n't on the best times with old hick holt and couldn't go to his clan besides after what had happened i didn't like to go near marion anyhow least way for a while i thought it would blow over soon she find out that he wa on a joking with the injun so one would have supposed twar nigh two weeks afore i heerd anything of her then i learnt that she war gone away nobody could tell why or where for nobody knew exceptin hick holt hisself and he ain't the sort of man to tell secrets lord of mercy i know now and it's worse than i expected ah the sooner heerd she war dead a deep-drawn sigh from the very bottom of his soul admonished me that the speaker had finished his painful recital i had no desire to prolong the conversation i saw that silence would be more agreeable to my companion and as if by a mutual and tacit impulse we turned our horses heads to the path and proceeded onward across the glade as we were about entering the timber on the other side my guide reined up his horse 
and sat for a moment gazing upon a particular spot as if something there had attracted his attention what there was no visible object at least none that was remarkable on the ground or elsewhere another sigh with the speech that followed explained the singularity of his behaviour thar said he pointing to the entrance of the forest path thar's the place where i last looked on marion end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter sixteen a predicament in prospect for half a mile beyond the glade the trace continued wide enough to admit of our riding abreast but notwithstanding this advantage no word passed between us my guide had relapsed into his attitude of melancholy deepened no doubt by the intelligence he had just received and sat loosely in his saddle his head drooping forward over his breast bitter thoughts within rendered him unconscious of what was passing without and i felt that any effort i might make to soften the acerbity of his reflections would be idle there are moments when words of consolation may be spoken in vain when instead of soothing a sorrow they add poison to its sting i made no attempt therefore to rouse my companion from his reverie but rode on by his side silent as he indeed there was sufficient unpleasantness in my own reflections to give me occupation though troubled by no heart canker of the past i had a future before me that was neither brilliant nor attractive the foreknowledge i had now gained of squatter holt had imbued me with a keen presentiment that i was treading upon the edge of a not very distant dilemma once or twice was i on the point of communicating my business to my travelling companion and why not with the openness of an honest heart he had confided to me the most important as well as the most painful secret of his life why should i withhold my confidence from him on a subject of comparatively little importance my reason for not making a confidant of him sooner has been already given it no longer existed so far from finding in him an ally of my yet hypothetical enemy in all likelihood i should have him on my die at all events i felt certain that i might count upon his advice and with his knowledge of the situation that might be worth having i was on the eve of declaring the object of my errand and soliciting his counsel thereon when i saw him suddenly rein in and turn towards me in the former movement i imitated his example the road forks here said he path on the left goes straight down to holt's clarin the other's the way to my bit of a shanty i shall have to thank you for the very kind service you have rendered me and say good night no not yet i ain't a-goin to leave you till i've put you within sight of holt's cabin though i can't go with you to the house as i told you he and i ain't on the best of terms i cannot think of your coming out of your way especially at this late hour i'm some little of a tracker myself and perhaps i can make out the path no stranger thar's places whar the trace is almost blind and you might get out o it there'll be no moon on it it runs through a thick timber bottom and there's an ugly bit of swamp as for the lateness i'm not very regular in my hours and there's a sort of road up the creek by which i can get home t'want to bid you good night that i stop here what then thought i endeavouring to conjecture his purpose while he was pausing in his speech stranger continued he in an altered tone i hope you won't take offence if i ask you a question not much fear of that i fancy ask it freely are ye sure a bit it hopes well upon my word to say the truth i am by no means sure of one it don't signify however i have my old cloak in my saddle and it wouldn't be the first time by hundreds that i've slept in the open air my reason for asking you air that if you ain't sure o one and don't mind stretching yourself on a bar skin there's such a thing in my shanty entirely at your service oh it's very kind of you perhaps i may have occasion to avail myself of your offer in truth i am not very confident of meeting with a friendly reception at the hands of your neighbour holt much less being asked to partake of his hospitality do you say so indeed yes from what i have heard i have reason to anticipate rather a cold welcome indeed but my companion hesitated in his speech as if meditating some observation which he felt a delicacy about making 
i'm a most ashamed continued he at length put another question that war on the top of my tongue i shall take pleasure in answering any question you may think proper to ask me i shouldn't ask it if it won't for what you have just now said for i hear the same question put to you this night afore and i heard your answer to it but i reckon twar the way in which it war asked that offended you and on that account your answer war just as it should have been to what question do you refer to your bidding it out here with hay holt i don't want to know it out of any curiosity of my own that's sartin stranger oh you are welcome to know all about it indeed it was my intention to have told you before we parted at the same time to ask you for some advice about the matter without further parley i communicated the object of my visit to mud creek conceding nothing that i deemed necessary for the elucidation of the subject without a word of interruption the young hunter heard my story to the end from the play of his features as i revealed the more salient points i could perceive that my chances of an amicable adjustment of my claim were far from being brilliant well do you know said he when i had finished speaking i had a suspicion that that might be your business i don't know why i should have thought so but maybe toward because there's been some others come here to settle a late and found squatters on their ground just the same as holt's on yourn that's why you heard me say a while ago that i shouldn't like to bow over his head and why not i awaited the answer to this question not without a certain degree of nervous anxiety i was beginning to comprehend the counsel of my nashville friend on that ticklish point of preemption why you see stranger as i told you hick holds her of customer and i reckon he'll be an ugly one to deal with on a business of that kind of course being in possession he may purchase the land he has the right of preemption oh tain't for that he ain't a-goin to preempt nor buy neither and for the best of reasons he ain't got a red cent in the world and shouldn't buy as much land as would make him a million patch not he how does he get his living then oh as for that just some at like myself there's gobs of game in the woods both barren deer and the clearin grows em corn there's cows and possums and turkeys too and lots of fish in a creek if one gets tired of the bar and the deer meat which i should never do but how about clothing and other necessaries that are not found in the woods oh as for our clothing it ain't hard to find we can get that in swampville by swapping skins for it or now and in some deer meat or anything else there ain't much needed about here powder and lead and a little coffee and tobacco once in a while if you like it a taste of old corn corn i thought the squatter raised that for himself so he do raise corn but i see stranger you don't understand the, our odd names there's two kind of corn in these parts that's as has been to the still and that as hain't it's the first of these sorts that hick holt lasts best oh i perceive your meaning he's fond of a little corn whiskey i presume i reckon he are that same squatter fonder than milk but surely continued the hunter changing the subject as well as the tone of his speech surely stranger you ain't a-goin on your biddin' it the night i've just begun to think that it is rather an odd hour to enter upon an estate the idea didn't occur to me before besides he added there's another reason if hick holt's what he used to be he ain't likely to be very nice about this time of night i hain't seen much of him lately but i reckon he's as fond of drink as ever he war and tain't often he goes to his bed without a skinful there's ten chances again one of your finding him with brick in his hat mm, that would be awkward don't think of going to night continued the young hunter in a persuasive tone come along with me and you can ride down to holt's in the morning you then find him more reasonable to deal with i can't offer you no great show of entertainment but there's a piece of deer meat in the house and i reckon i can raise up a cup of coffee and a bone or two of bread as for yo show the old corn crib ain't quite empty yet thanks thanks said i grasping the hunter's hand in the warmth of my gratitude i accept your invitation this way then stranger we struck into a path that led to the right and after riding about two miles further arrived at the solitary home of the hunter a log cabin surrounded by a clearing i soon found he was its sole occupant as he was its owner some half dozen large dogs being the only living creatures that were present to bid us welcome a rude horse shed was at hand a loose box it might be termed as it was only intended to accommodate one and this was placed at the disposal of my arab the critter of my host had for that night to take to the woods and choose his stall among the trees 
but to that sort of treatment he had been well inured. A close-chinked cabin for a lodging, a bear-skin for a bed, a cold venison, cornbread, and coffee for supper, with a pipe to follow. All these, garnished with the cheer of a hearty welcome, constitute an entertainment not to be despised by an old campaigner, and such was the treatment I met with under the hospitable clapboard roof of the young backwoodsman Frank Wingrove. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter Seventeen The Indian Summer. Look forth on the forest ere autumn wind scatters its frondage of scarlet and purple and gold that forest through which the great father of waters for thousands of years his broad current has rolled gaze over that forest of opaline hue with a heaven above it of glorious blue and say is there seen in this beautiful world where nature more gaily her flag has unfurled or thinkest thou that e'en in the region of bliss there's a landscape more truly elysian than this behold the dark sumac in crimson arrayed whose veins with the deadliest poison are rife and side by her side on the edge of the glade the sassafras laurel restorer of life behold the tall maples turned red in their hue and the muscadine vine with its clusters of blue then the lotus whose leaves have scarce time to unfold ere they drop to discover its berries of gold and the bay tree perfumed never changing its sheen and for ever enrobed in its mantle of green and list to the music borne over the trees it falls on the ear giving pleasure ecstatic the song of the birds and the hum of the bees commingling their tones with the ripples erratic hark hear you the red-crested cardinal's call from the groves of anona from tulip tree tall the mocking-bird responding below in the glade the dove softly cooing in mellower shade while the oriole answers in accents of mirth oh where is their melody sweeter on earth in infamy now the bold slanderer slumbers who falsely declared twas a land without song had he listened as i to those musical numbers that live in its woods through the summer day long had he slept in the shade of its blossoming trees or inhaled their sweet balm ever loading the breeze he would scarcely have ventured on statements so wrong for plants without perfume her birds without song ah closet philosopher sure in that hour you have never beheld the magnolia's flower surely here the hesperian gardens were found for how could such land to the gods be unknown and where is there spot on african ground so like to a garden a goddess would own and the dragon so carelessly guarding the tree which the hero whose guide was a god of the sea destroyed before plucking the apples of gold was not but that monster the mammoth of old if earth ever owned spots so divinely caressed sure that region of eld was the land of the west the memory of that scene attunes my soul to song awakening any muse from the silence in which she has long slumbered but the voice of the coy maiden is less melodious than of yore she shies me for my neglect and despite the gentlest courting refuses to breathe her divine spirit over a scene worthy of a sweeter strain and this scene lay not upon the classic shores of the hellespont not in the famed valleys of alp and alpenine not by the romantic borders of the rhine but upon the banks of mud creek in the state of tennessee in truth it was a lovely landscape or rather a succession of landscapes through which i rode after leaving the cabin of my hospitable host it was the season of indian summer that singular phenomenon of the occidental clime when the sun as if ruining his southern declension appears to return along the line of the zodiac he loves better the virgin than aquarius and lingering to take a fond look on that fair land he has fertilized by his beams dispels for a time his intruding antagonist the hoary boreas but his last kiss kills there is too much patience in his parting glance the forest is fired by its fervour and many of its fairest forms the rival trod of the north may never clasp in his cold embrace in sooty like devotion they scorn to shun the flame but with outstretched arms inviting it 
offer themselves as a holocaust to him through the long summer day has smiled upon their trembling existence at this season of the year too the virgin forest is often the victim of another despoiler the hurricane sweeping them with spiteful breath this rude destroyer strikes down the trees like fragile reeds prostrating at once the noblest and humblest forms not one is left standing on the soil for the clearing of the hurricane is a complete work and neither stalk sapling nor stump may be seen where it has passed even the giants of the forest yield to its strength as though smitten by the hand of a destroying angel uprooted they lie along the earth side by side the soil still clinging to the clavicles of their roots and their leafy tops turn to the lee in this prostrate alignment slowly to wither and decay a forest thus fallen presents for a time a picture of melancholy aspect it suggests the idea of some grand battlefield where the serried hosts by a terrible discharge of grape and canister have been struck down on the instant not one being left to look to the bodies of the slain neither to bury nor remove them like the battlefield too it becomes the haunt of wolves and other wild beasts who find among the fallen trunks if not food a fastness securing them from the pursuit both of hound and hunter here in hollow log the black she-bear gives birth to her loutish cubs training them to climb over the decaying trunks here the lynx and red cougar choose their cunning convert here the raccoon rambles over his beaten track the sly possum crawls warily along the log or goes to sleep among the tangle of dry rhizomes while the gaunt brown wolf may be oft heard howling amidst the ruin or in hoarse bark baying the midnight moon in a few years however the sombre scene assumes a more cheerful aspect an undergrowth springs up that soon conceals the skeletons of the dead trees plants and shrubs appear often of different genera and species from those that hitherto usurped the soil and the ruin is no longer apparent the mournful picture gives place to one of luxuriant sweetness the more brilliant sheen of the young trees and shrubs now covering the ground and contrasting agreeably with the sombre hues of the surrounding forest no longer reigns that melancholy silence that for a while held dominion over the scene if at intervals be heard the wild scream of the cougar or the distant howling of wolves these scarcely interrupt the music falling endlessly upon the ear the red cardinals the orioles the warbling fringildae and the polyglot thrushes who meet here as if by agreement to make this lovely sylvan spot the scene of their forest concerts shortly after leaving the cabin of this young backwoodsman my path hitherto passing under the gloomy shadows of the forest debouched upon just such a scene i had been warned of its proximity my host at parting had given me directions as to how i should find my way across the harricane through which ran the trace that conducted to the clearing of the squatter some two miles further down the creek i was prepared to behold a track of timber laid prostrate by the storm the trees all lying in one direction and exhibiting the usual scathed and dreary aspect instead of this on emerging from the dark forest i was agreeably surprised by a glorious landscape that burst upon my view it was as already stated that season of the year when the american woods array themselves in their most attractive robes when the very leaves appear as if they were flowers so varied and brilliant are their hues when the foliage of the young beeches become a pale yellow and glimmers translucent against the sun when the maples are dying off on a deep red and the sumac and sassafras turning respectively crimson and scarlet when the large droops of the osage orange the purple clusters of the fox grape and the golden berries of the persimmon or virginian lotus hang temptingly from the tree just at that season when the benignant earth has perfected and is about to yield up her annual bounty and all nature is gratefully rejoicing at the gift no wonder i was agreeably impressed by the gorgeous landscape no wonder i reined up and permitted my eyes to dwell upon it while my heart responded to the glad chorus that from bird and bee was rising up to heaven around me i too felt joyous under the reflection that amid such lovely scenes i had chosen my future home End of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter Eighteen A Backwoods Venus. 
after indulging for some time in a sort of dreamy contemplation i once more gave the bridle to my horse and rode onward i was prepared for a tortuous path my host had forewarned me of this the hurricane he said was only three hundred yards in breadth but i should have to ride nearly twice that distance in crossing it his statement proved literally true the old trace passing down the creek bottom had run at right angles to the direction of the storm and of course the trees had fallen perpendicularly across the path where they still lay thick as hurdles set for a donkey race some of them could be stepped over by a horse and a few might be jumped but there were others that rose breast high and a flying leap over a five-barred gate would have been an easy exploit compared with clearing one of these monstrous barriers i might add also from experience that leaping a log is a feat of considerable danger there is no room for topping and should the iron hoof strike there is nothing that will yield on the other side the rider has the pleasant prospect of a broken neck either for himself or his horse not being in any particular hurry i took the matter quietly and wound my way through a labyrinth worthy of being the maze of fair rosamond i could not help remarking the singular effect which the hurricane had produced to the right and left as far as my view could range extended an opening like some vast avenue that had been cleared for the passage of giants and by giants made on each side appeared the unbroken forest the trunks standing like columns with shadowy aisles between their outward or edge row trending in a straight line as if so planted these showed not a sign that the fierce tornado had passed so near them though others whose limbs almost interlocked with theirs had been mowed down without mercy by the ruthless storm i had arrived within fifty yards of the opposite side and the dark forest was again before my face but even at that short distance the eye vainly endeavoured to pierce its sombre depths i was congratulating myself that i had passed the numerous logs that lay across the path when yet one more appeared between me and the standing trees it had been one of the tallest victims of the tornado and now lay transversely to the line of the track which cut it about midway on nearing this obstacle i saw that the trace forked into two one going around the tops of the decaying branches while the other took the direction of the roots which with the soil still adhering to them formed a rounded buttress-like wall of full ten feet in diameter the trunk itself was not over five that being about the thickness of the tree it was a matter of choice which of the two paths should be followed since both appeared to come together again on the opposite side of the tree but i had made up my mind to take neither one of my motives in seeking this forest home had been a desire to indulge in the exciting exercise of the chase and the sooner i should bring my horse into practice the sooner i might take the field with a prospect of success log leaping was new to my arab and he might stand in need of a little training to it the log before me had open ground on both sides and afforded a very good opportunity for giving him his first lesson thus prompted by a st hubert i was about spurring forward to the run when a hoof-stroke falling upon my ear summoned me to desist from my intention the sound proceeded from the forest before my face and peering into its darkness i could perceive that some one also on horseback was coming along the path this caused me to change my design or rather to pause until the person should pass had i continued in my determination to leap the log i should in all likelihood have dashed my horse at full gallop against that of the approaching traveller since our courses lay directly head to head while waiting till he should ride out of the way i became aware that i had committed an error only in regard to the sex of the person who was approaching it was not a he on the contrary something so very different that as soon as i had succeeded in shading the sun glare out of my eyes and obtained a fair view of the equestrian traveller my indifference was at an end i beheld one of the loveliest apparitions ever made manifest in female form or i need scarcely add in any other it was a young girl certainly not over sixteen years of age but with a contour close verging upon womanhood her beauty was of that character which cannot be set forth by a detailed description in words in true loveliness there is a harmony of the features that will not suffer them to be considered apart nor does the eye take note of any one to regard it as unique or characteristic it is satisfied with the coup de voile of the whole if i may be permitted the expression real beauty needs not to be considered it is acknowledged at a glance eye and heart impressed with it at the same instant search not to study its details the impression made upon me by the first sight of this young girl was that of something soft and strikingly beautiful of a glorious golden hue 
the reflection of bright amber-coloured hair on a blonde skin tinged with a hue of vermilion something that imparted a sort of luminous radiance divinely feminine even under the shadow of the trees this luminous radiance was apparent as if the face had a halo around it the reader may smile at such exalted ideas and deem them the offspring of a romantic fancy but had he looked as i into the liquid depths of those large eyes with their blue irises and darker pupils had he gazed upon that cheek tinted as with cochineal those lips shaming the hue of the rose that throat of ivory white those golden tresses translucent in the sunlight he would have felt as i that something shone before his eyes a face such as the athenian fancy has elaborated into an almost living reality in the goddess cytheria in short it was the venus of my fancy the very ideal i had imbibed from gazing upon many a picture of the grecian goddess the prognostication of my friend had proved emphatically false if it was not venus i saw before me it appeared her counterpart in human form and this fair creature was costumed in the simplest manner almost coarsely clad a sleeved dress of homespun with a yellowish stripe loosely worn and open at the breast a cotton sunbonnet was the only covering for her head her bright amber-coloured hair the only shawl upon her shoulders over which it fell in ample luxuriance a string of pearls around her neck false ones i could see was the sole effort that vanity seemed to have made for there was no other article of adornment even shoes and stockings were wanting but the most costly chasseur could not have added to the elegance of those mignon feet that daintily protruding below the skirt of her dress rested along the flank of the horse more commonplace even than her homespun frock was the steed that carried her a sorry-looking animal that resembled the skeleton of a horse with the skin left on there was no saddle scarce the semblance of one a piece of bearskin strapped over the back with a rough thong did service for a saddle and the little feet hung loosely down without step or stirrup the girl kept her seat partly by balancing but as much by holding on to the high bony withers of the horse that rose above its shoulders like the hump of a dromedary the scant mane wound around her tiny fingers scarcely covered them while with the other hand she clasped the black reins of an old dilapidated bridle the want of saddle and stirrup did not hinder her from poising herself gracefully upon the piece of bearskin but hers was a figure that could not be ungraceful in any attitude and as the old horse hobbled along the rude movement all the more palpably displayed the magnificent moulding of her body and limbs the contrast between horse and rider the old critter and the young creature was ridiculously striking the former appearing a burlesque of the most beautiful of quadrupeds while the latter was the very impersonation of the loveliest of biped forms it is scarcely probable that the cyprian goddess could ever have been brought into such a ludicrous juxtaposition a shame upon mercury if she was in classic lore we find mention of no such sorry steed and for his counterpart in story we must seek in more modern times fixing upon the famed charger of calatrava's knight but here the analogy must end the charms of the dark-haired dulcinea can be brought into no comparison with those of the golden-haired wood-nymph of the obion bottom end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter nineteen a series of contretemps at the sight of this charming equestrian all thoughts of leaping the log were driven out of my mind and i rode quietly forward with the intention of going round it it might be that i timed the pace of my horse mechanically no doubt but however that may have been i arrived at the prostrate tree just as the young girl reached it from the opposite side we were thus brought face to face the log barrier between us i would have spoken but for the life of me i could not think of something graceful to say and to have used the hackneyed phraseology of fine morning miss would in those beautiful blue eyes that glistened under the shadow of the sunbonnet have rendered me as commonplace as the remark i felt certain it would and therefore said nothing some acknowledgment however was necessary and lifting the forage cap from my forehead i bowed slightly 
as such a salutation required, but with all the verve that politeness would permit. My salutation was acknowledged by a nod, and, as I fancied, a smile. Either was grace enough for me to expect, but whether the smile was the offspring of a feeling in my favour or at my expense, I was unable at the moment to determine. I should have an opportunity of repeating the bow, as we met again in going round the tree. Then I should certainly speak to her, and as I turned my horse's head to the path, I set about thinking of something to say. I had taken the path leading to the right, that which passed round the root of the tree. Of the two ways this appeared to be the shorter and the more used. What was my chagrin when, in glancing over my arm, I perceived that I had made a most grievous mistake? The girl was going in the opposite direction. Yes, she had chosen to ride round the branching tops of the dead wood, by all the gods a much wider circuit. Was it accident or design? It had the appearance of the latter. I fancied so, and fell many degrees in my own estimation. Her choosing what was evidently the roundabout direction argued unwillingness that we should meet again, since the mazy movement we were now performing precluded all chance of a second encounter, except with the great log still between us. Even then we should be no longer vis-à-vis -vis as before, but dos a do, almost on the instant of our approaching. To ensure even this poor privilege, I rode rapidly round the great buttress of roots that for a moment concealed the fair equestrian from my sight. I did this with the intention of getting forward in time. So rapidly did I pass, and so absorbed was I in the idea of another sweet salutation, that I saw not the fearful creature that lay basking upon the log on the sunny side of the upheaved mass of earth. Once on the other side, I discovered that I had made a third mistake, equally as provoking as a second. I had arrived too soon. Golden hair was away up among the tangle of treetops. I could see her bright face gleaming through the branches, now and then hidden by the broad leaves of the bignonias that laced them together. To make me still more miserable, I fancied that she was moving with a studied slowness. I had already reached that point where the path parted from the log. I dared not pause. There was no excuse for it. Not the shadow of one could I think of, and, with a lingering towards that glittering attraction, I reluctantly headed my horse to the forest. A last glance over my shoulder disclosed no improvement in my situation. She was still behind the trellised leafwork of the bignonias, where she had stayed perhaps to pluck a flower. Happier far if I had never seen her, was the reflection that occurred to me as I entered the gloomy shadow of the trees, less gloomy than my own thoughts. With one circumstance I now reproached myself. Why had I been so shy with this forest damsel? The very way to secure her indifference. Why had I not spoken to her only in commonplace? Even good day would have promised me a response, and the result could not have been more unfavorable. Why the deuce had I not bidden her good day? I should have heard her voice, no doubt an additional charm, for I never yet saw a beautiful woman with a harsh voice and I fear the inverse proposition is equally true. Why passed I without speaking? No doubt she deems me a yokel. Perhaps it was my very shyness she was smiling at. So death, what a simpleton! Oh, what do I hear? A woman's voice, a cry of terror? There again a scream. Oh, the words, help, oh, help! Is it she who is calling? Yes, yes, it is she. By such strange sounds were my reflections interrupted. Turning my horse with a wrench, I urged him back along the path. I was yet scarcely a dozen lengths from the log, for the reflections above detailed were but the thoughts of a moment. Half a dozen bounds of my steed brought me back to the edge of the standing timber where I pulled up to ascertain the purport of this singular summons that had reached me. I made no inquiry. No explanation was needed. The scene explained itself, for at that moment of my emerging from the shadowy path I had a tableau under my eyes, expressive as it was terrifying. The girl was upon the other side of the log, and near the point where she should have turned off from it, but instead of advancing, I saw that she had come to a halt, her attitude expressing the wildest terror, as if some fearful object was before her. The jade, too, showed affright by snorting loudly, his head raised high in the air and his long ears pointing forward. The young girl was dragging mechanically on the bridle, as if to head him away from the spot, but this was impossible. Another log overlapping the first formed an avenue so narrow as to leave not the slightest chance of a horse being able to turn in it. Into this the animal had backed. There was no way of his getting from between the two trunks, but by going straight forward or backward. Forward he dared not go, and backward he was moving as fast as the nature of the place would permit, now halting with his hips against one of the logs, 
then with a quick rush backing against the other that but for the support thus obtained would have brought him upon his haunches the retrograde movement on the part of the horse was evidently the result of terror at the sight of some object in front it was aided also by the half-mechanical action of the rider who was pulling continuously on the bridle and repeating her cries for help appeared equally to suffer from fright my astonishment was of short duration effect and cause came under my eye almost at the same instant the latter i saw upon the log in hideous form the form of a cougar slowly advancing along the dead wood not by bounds or paces but with the stealthy tread of a cat his long red body stretched out to its full extent the beast more resembled a gigantic caterpillar than a quadruped i could scarcely detect the movement of his limbs so closely did the monster crawl but his great tail tapering three feet behind him was seen vibrating from side to side or at intervals moving with quick jerks expressive of the enjoyment he was receiving in the contemplation of his prey for such he deemed the helpless maiden before him i saw not the cougar's face hideous sight at such a moment nor yet his eyes both were turned from me and fixed steadfastly upon his intended victim the fierce beast did not perceive my approach perhaps a fortunate circumstance once or twice i saw him pause as if crouching for a spring luckily the old horse making a fresh retrogression caused the cougar again to advance along the log in the same creeping attitude as before with a glance i had comprehended the situation indeed at the first glance i understood it perfectly my delay in acting only arose from the necessity of preparing for action and that did not take long it was habitual with me to carry my rifle over my shoulder or rest it across the pommel of my saddle in either case always in hand it was but the work of a moment to get the piece ready the pressure of the muzzle against my horse's ear was a signal well understood and at once rendered him as immobile as if made of bronze many years of practice during which i had often aimed at higher game had steeled my nerves and straightened my sight both proved sufficiently true for the destruction of the cougar quick after the crack i saw his red body roll back from the log and when the smoke thinned off i could see the animal writhing upon the ground why the cougar had fallen to my side i could not tell for he was fairly on the ridge of the dead wood when i fired perhaps on receiving the shot he had fancied that it came from the only enemy visible to him and by an instinct impelling him to escape had tumbled off in the opposite direction i perceived that he was not yet dead he was still wriggling about among the branches but it was clear that the piece of lead had taken the spring out of him the bullet had passed through his spine crashing the column in twain after playing upon him with my revolving pistol until i had emptied three or four of its chambers i had the satisfaction of seeing him give his last spasmodic kick what followed i leave to the imagination of my reader suffice it to say that the incident proved my friend the ice of indifference was broken and i was rewarded for my sleight-of-hand prowess by something more than smiles by words of praise that rang melodiously in my ear words of gratitude spoken with the free innocent naivete of childhood revealing on the part of her who gave utterance to them a truly grateful heart i rode back with my fair protege across the track of fallen timber i could have gone with her to the end of the world the tortuous path hindered me from holding much converse with her only now and then was there opportunity for a word i remember little of what was said on my side no doubt much that was commonplace but even her observations i can recall but confusedly the power of love was upon me like absorbing both soul and sense engrossing every thought of the contemplation of the divine creature by my side i cared not to talk enough for me to look and listen i did not think of questioning her as to whence she had come even her name was neither asked nor ascertained whither she was going was revealed only by the accident of conversation she was on her way to visit some one who lived on the other side of the creek some friend of her father would that i could have claimed to be her father's friend his relative his son we reached a ford it was the crossing place the house for which her visit was designed stood not far off on the other side and i must needs leave her emboldened by what had passed i caught hold of that little hand it was a rare liberty but i was no longer master of myself there was no resistance but i could perceive that the tiny fingers trembled at my touch the old horse with provoking impatience plunged into the stream and we were parted i watched her while crossing the creek the crystal drops sparkled like pearls upon her naked feet some of them dashed higher by the hoofs of the horse were sprinkled upon her cheek 
and clung to the carmined skin as if kissing it i envied those diamond drops lingering upon the bank i gazed upon her receding form with my eyes followed it through the forest aisle and then saw it only at intervals moving like some bright meteor among the trees until by a sudden turning in the path it was taken from my sight end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter Twenty. Sweet and bitter. Slowly and reluctantly, I turned back from the stream and once more entered amid the wreck of the hurricane along the sunny path the flowers appeared to sparkle with a fresher brilliancy imbuing the air with sweet odours wafted from many a perfumed chalice the birds sang with clearer melody the hum of the honey-bee rang through the glades more harmoniously than ever the coo-coo-coo of the doves blended with the love-call of the squirrel betokened that both were inspired by the tenderest of passions pensando de amor as the spanish phrase finally expresses it for at that moment the beautiful words of the southern port were in my thoughts and upon my lips aunque las fieras on sus garridas enternecidas pensan de amor even the fierce beasts in their forest lairs become gentle under the influence of this all-pervading passion i rode on slowly and in silence my whole soul absorbed in the contemplation of that fair being whose image seemed still before my eyes palpable as if present my heart quivered under the influence of a gentle joy the past appeared bright the present happiness itself the future full of hope i had found the very wilderness home of my longings the fair spirit that should be my minister no doubt rose before my mind to dim the brilliant prospect before me no shadow hung over the horizon of my hopes the prospect before me appeared bright and sunny as the sky above my head within and without the world was smiling all nature seemed tinted with the hue of the rose this delightful reverie lasted for a time alas too short a time only while i was traversing the track that but the moment before i had passed over in such pleasant companionship on arriving at the scene of my late adventure a turn was given to my thoughts it had been a scene of triumph and deserved commemoration the body of the panther lay across the path his shining skin was a trophy not to be despised and dismounting on the spot with my hunting knife i secured it i could point to it with pride as the first spoil obtained in my new hunting field but i should prize it still more as the memento of a far sweeter sentiment in a few minutes it was folded up and strapped over the cantle of my saddle and with this odd addition to my equipage i once more plunged into the forest path for the next mile the trace led through heavy bottom timber such as we had traversed after leaving the settlement of swampville the black earth of alluvial origin was covered deeply with decayed vegetation and the track of horses and cattle had converted the path into mud at intervals it was intersected by embayments of wet morass the projecting arms of a great swamp that appeared to run parallel with the creek through these my horse unused to such footing passed with difficulty often floundering up to his flanks in the mud though it was but the hour of noon it more resembled night or the late gloaming of twilight so dark were the shadows under this umbrageous wood as if to strengthen the illusion i could hear the cry of the bittern and the screech of the owl echoing through the aisles of the forest sounds elsewhere suggestive of night and darkness now and then light shone upon the path the light that indicates an opening in the forest but it was not that of a friendly clearing only the break caused by some dismal lagoon amidst whose dank stagnant waters even the cypress cannot grow the habitat of black water snakes and mud turtles of cranes herons and quabirds hundreds of these i saw perched upon the rotting half-submerged trunks upon the cypress knees that rose like brown obelisks around the edge of the water or winged their slow flight through the murky gloom and filling the air with their deafening screams on both sides of the trace towered gigantic trees flanked at their bases with huge projections that appeared like the battlements of a fortress these singular protuberances rose far above the height of my horse radiating from the trunks on every side 
and often causing the path to take a circuitous direction in the deep gloom the track would have been difficult to follow but for an occasional blaze appearing upon the smooth bark of the sycamores the scene was by no means suggestive of pleasant reflections the less so since i had ascertained from my host of yesternight that the greater portion of section number nine was of just such a character and that there was scarcely a spot upon it fit for a homestead except the one already occupied such an encumbrance on my estate reflected i is worse than the heaviest mortgage and i should have been willing at that moment to part with the timber at a very low valuation but i well knew the value of such a commodity on the thames or the mercy a mine of wealth on mud creek it would not have been taken as a gift my spirits fell as i rode forward partly influenced by the sombre scenes through which i was passing partly by the natural reaction which ever follows the hour of sweet enjoyment and partly no doubt from some unpleasant presentiments that were once more shaping themselves in my mind up to this time i had scarcely given thought to my errand or its object first the gay hues of the morning and then the romantic incidents of the hour had occupied my thoughts and hindered me from dwelling on future plans or purposes now however that i was coming close to the clearing of the squatter i began to feel that i was also approaching a crisis End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty one a rude response an opening of about two acres in extent of irregular semicircular shape with the creek for its cord and a worm fence zigzagging around its arc scarcely a clearing since trees bleached and barkless stand thickly over it a log shanty with clapboard roof in the centre of the concavity flanked on one side by a rude horse shed on the other by a corn crib of split rails all three shed shanty and crib like the tower of pisa threatening to tumble down near the shanty a woodpile with an old axe lying upon the chop block by the shed and crib a litter of white shucks and cobs in front among the stumps and girdled trees a thin straggle of withered cornstalks shorn of their leafy tops some standing some trampled down such was the picture before my eyes as with my horse breast up against the fence i looked into the clearing of squatter holt it must be the place my place there is no other clearing within a mile my directions have been given with exact minuteness of detail i have followed them to the letter i cannot be mistaken i have reached holt's clearing at last i had ridden quite up to the fence but could see no gate a set of bars however between two roughly mortised uprights indicated an entrance to the enclosure the top bar was out not feeling inclined to dismount i sprang my horse over the others and then trotted forward in front of the shanty the door stood wide open i had hopes that the sound of my horse's hoof-stroke would have brought some one into it but no one came was there nobody within i waited for a minute or two listening for some sign of life in the interior of the cabin no voice reached me no sound of any one stirring perhaps the cabin was empty not untenanted since i could perceive the signs of occupation and some articles of rude furniture visible inside the doorway perhaps the inmates had gone out for a moment and might be in the woods near at hand i looked around the clearing and over the fence into the forest beyond no one to be seen no one to be heard without the cabin as within reigned a profound silence not a living thing in sight save the black vultures a score of which perched on the dead woods overhead and fetid as their food were infecting the air with their carrion odour although within easy range of my rifle the foul birds took no heed of my movements but sat still indolently extending their broad wings to the sun now and then one coming one going in slow silent flight their very shadows seeming to flit lazily among the withered maize plants that covered the ground i had no desire to appear rude i already regretted having leaped my horse over the bars even that might be regarded as rather a brusque method of approach to a private dwelling but i was in hopes it would not be noticed since there appeared to be no one who had witnessed it i coughed and made other noises with like unfruitful result 
my demonstrations were either not heard or if heard unheeded certainly thought i if there be any one in the house they must not only hear but see me for although there was no window i could perceive that the logs were but poorly chinked and from within the house the whole clearing must have been in sight nay more the interior itself was visible from without at least the greater part of it and while making this observation i fancied i could trace the outlines of a human figure through the interstices of the logs i became convinced it was a human figure and furthermore the figure of a man it was odd he had not heard me was he asleep no that could not be from the attitude in which he was he appeared to be seated in a chair but with his body erect and his head held aloft in such position he could scarcely be asleep after making this reflection i coughed again louder than before but to no better purpose i thought the figure moved i was sure it moved but as if with no intention of stirring from the seat cool indifference thought i what can the fellow mean i grew impatient and feeling a little provoked by the inexplicable somnolency of the owner of the cabin i determined to try whether my voice might not rouse him ho house there i shouted though not loudly ho holla any one within again the figure moved but still stirred not from the seat i repeated both my summons and query this time in still a louder and more commanding tone and this time i obtained a response who the hell are you came a voice through the interstices of the logs a voice that more resembled the growl of a bear than the articulation of a human throat who the hell are you repeated the voice while at the same time i could perceive the figure rising from the chair i made no answer to the rough query i saw that my last summons had been sufficient i could hear the hewn floor planks cracking under the heavy boot and knew from this that my questioner was passing towards the door in another instant he stood in the doorway his body filling it from side to side from head to stoop a fearful-looking man was before me a man of gigantic stature with a beard reaching to the second button of his coat and above it a face not to be looked upon without a sensation of terror a countenance expressive of determined courage but at the same time of ferocity untempered by any trace of a softer emotion a shaggy sand-coloured beard slightly grizzled eyebrows like a chevaux de frise of hog's bristles eyes of a greenish grey with a broad livid scar across the left cheek were component parts in producing this expression while a red cotton kerchief wound turban-like around the head and pulled low down in front rendered it more palpable and pronounced a loose coat of thick green blanket somewhat faded and worn added to the colossal appearance of the man while a red flannel shirt served him also for a vest his large limbs were inserted in pantaloons of blue kentucky jeans cloth but these were scarcely visible hidden by the skirt of the ample blanket coat that draped down below the tops of a pair of rough horse-skin boots reaching above the knee and into which the trousers had been tucked the face of the man was a singular picture the colossal stature rendered it more striking the costume corresponded and all were in keeping with the rude manner of my reception it was idle to ask the question from the description given me by the young backwoodsman i knew the man before me to be hickman holt the squatter End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty two a rough reception for fashion's sake i was about to utter the usual formula mr holt i presume but the opportunity was not allowed me no sooner had the squatter appeared in his doorway than he followed up his blasphemous interrogatory with a series of others couched in language equally rude what's all this muss about durn your stinkin imperence who air you and what air your order i wish to see mr holt i replied struggling hard to keep my temper you wish to see mr holt there's no mr holt about here no no damnation no ding hear me to understand you to say that hickman holt does not live here you understand me to say no such a thing it's hick holt you mean he does live here hick holt yes that is the name what if it is i wish to see him looky her stranger 
and the words were accompanied by a significant look. "'If an earnest sheriff, Hick Holt ain't at home. You understand me? He ain't at home.' The last phrase was rendered more emphatic by the speaker as he uttered it, raising the flap of his blanket coat and exhibiting a huge bowie knife stuck through the waistband of his trousers. I understood the hint perfectly. "'I am not the sheriff,' I answered in an assuring tone. I was in hopes of gaining favour by the declaration, for I had already fancied that my bizarre reception might be owing to some error of this kind. "'I am not the sheriff,' I repeated impressively. "'You're not the sheriff. One of his constables, then, I suppose.' "'Neither one nor other,' I replied, pocketing the affront. "'And who are you, anyhow, with your damn glitter and buttons and your waist drawed in like a skewered skunk?' This was intolerable. But remembering the advice of my Nashville friend, with some additional counsel I had received overnight, I strove hard to keep down my rising collar. "'My name,' said I. "'Dern your name!' exclaimed the giant, interrupting me. "'I don't care a doggone for your name. Tell me your business. That's what I want to know.' "'I have already told you my business. I wish to see Mr. Holt. Hick Holt, if you like.' "'Does I Hick Holt?' "'What if that's all your business you've seen him, and now you can go?' This was rather a literal interpretation of my demand, but, without permitting myself to be nonplussed by it, or paying any heed to the abrupt words of dismissal, I replied, half interrogatively, "'You, then, are he? You are Hick Holt, I suppose?' "'Who said I ain't? Darn your imperence! Now, then, what do you want with me?' The filthy language, the insulting tone in which it was uttered, the bullying manner of the man, evidently relying upon his giant strength and formidable aspect, were rapidly producing their effect upon me, but in a manner quite contrary to that anticipated by Master Holt. It was no doubt his design to awe me, but he little knew the man he had to deal with. Whether it might be called courage or not, I was just as reckless of life as he. I had exposed my person too often, both in single combat and on the battlefield, to be cowed by a bully, such as I fancied this fellow to be, and the spirit of resistance was fast rising within me. His dictatorial style was unendurable, and discarding all further prudential considerations, I resolved to submit to it no longer. I did not give way to idle recrimination. Perhaps, thought I, a firm tone may suit my purpose better, and in my reply I adopted it. Before I could answer his question, however, he had repeated it in a still more peevish and impatient manner, with an additional epithet of insult. "'Well, Mr. Jaybird,' said he, "'be quick about it. What do you want me? "'In the first place, Mr. Hickman Holt, I want civil treatment from you, "'and secondly, I was not permitted to finish my speech. "'I was interrupted by an exclamation, a horrid oath, "'that came fiercely hissing from the lips of the squatter. "'Damnation!' cried he. "'You'll be damned civil treatment, deed. "'You're a putty fellow to talk of civil treatment. "'Arter jumping your horse over a man's fence "'and riding slap jam into his door, "'out being asked, "'let me tell you, Mr. Gilt Buttons, "'I don't allow any man, "'white, black, or Injun, "'to enter my clearing "'without first knowing his reason. "'You hear that, dear? "'You're clearing. "'Are you sure it's yours?' "'The squatter turned red upon the instant.' Rage may have been the passion that brought the colour to his cheeks, but I could perceive that my words had produced another emotion in his mind, which added to the hideousness of the cast at that moment given to his features. "'Not my clarin!' he thundered, with the embellishment of another imprecation. "'Not my clarin! Show me the man who says it's not! Show him to me, buddy almighty eternal! You won't say it twice! Have you purchased it?' "'Near a mind for that, mister, I've made it. "'That's my style of purchase, and by God I'll stand good, I reckon. "'Consarn your skin, what have you got to do with it anyhow?' "'This,' I replied, still struggling to keep calm, "'at the same time taking the title deeds for my saddlebags. "'This only, Mr. Holt, that your house stands upon section number nine, "'that I have bought that section from the United States government, "'and must therefore demand of you, "'either to use your preemption right, or deliver the land over to me.' Here is the government grant. You may examine it, if you feel so inclined. An angry oath was the response, or rather a volley of oaths. I tort that was your business, continued the swearer. I tort so. 
but just this time you came upon a fool's errand darn the government grant darn your preemption right and darn your title papers too i don't value them more than them blur corn shucks i don't i got my preemption document inside here i'll just show you that mister and see how you like it the speaker turned back into his cabin and for a moment i lost sight of him preemption document he said was it possible he had purchased the place and was gone to fetch his title deeds if so Oh, my reflection was cut short in another moment he reappeared in the doorway not with any papers in his hand but instead a long rifle that with its butt resting on the door stoop stood almost as high as himself no mister turn me out said he speaking in a satirical triumphant tone and raising the piece in front of him where's my title my preemption rights the right of the rifle well it's clear enough you'll acknowledge that won't you no i replied in a firm voice you won't the hell you won't look here stranger i'm in earnest look in my eye and see if i ain't i give you warning then that if you're not out of this clearing in six jumps on squall you'll never go out of it a living man you see that air stump it shatters just a creeping up to the house the minute that shatter touches the wall i'll shoot you down as sure as my name's hick holt mind i've gin you warning and i'll give you warning mr holt that i am prepared to defend myself and if you miss miss ejaculated he with a contemptuous toss of the head miss ye fool there's no fear of that if you miss continued i without heeding the interruption i shall show you no mercy if you are going to take the cowardly advantage of having the first shot i have my advantage too in self-defence i shall be justified in killing you and if you fire at me i shall certainly do so be warned i never spare a coward coward exclaimed the colossus with an imprecation that was horrible to hear now if i don't miss continued he apparently calming his rage and speaking with a significant sneer intended to awe me by insinuating the certainty of his aim how if i don't miss mr popgun you may for all that don't be too sure of hitting i've been shot at before now you never been shot at her now ship and you leave this clearing one crack for my gun'll be enough for you i reckon i'll take my chance if it should go against me you won't gain by it remember my good man it's not a duel we're fighting you have chosen to attack me and if i should fall in the affair i've faith enough in the law to believe it will avenge me i fancied that my speech produced some effect upon the fellow and seeing that he remained silent i followed it up by words of similar import if it be my fate to fall i leave behind my friends who will inquire into my death trust me they will do so if i kill you it will be but justified homicide and will be so adjudged while your killing me will be regarded in a different light it will be pronounced murder i gave full emphasis to the last word on hearing it my antagonist showed signs of emotion i fancied i saw him tremble and turn slightly pale with an unsteady voice he replied murder no no i've given you warning to go you have time enough yet to save yourself get out of the clearing and there'll be no harm done ye i shall not go out of the clearing until you've acknowledged my claim and you'll never get out alive i swear by god never you are determined then to be my murderer again i pronounced the word in the most emphatic tone i saw that it affected him in some singular way whether through a fear of consequences or that there still lingered in his heart some spark of humanity or perhaps but least possible of all he was beginning to be ashamed of his foul play by which of these three motives or by what other inspired i could not guess but he seemed to cower under the imputation murderer echoed he after a moment of apparent reflection no no it's bad enough to have to blame it out without being guilty of it. i ain't a gwine to murder you but i ain't a gwine neither to let you go i might a did so a minute agone but you've lost your chance you've called me a coward and by the eternal no man'll say that word a hick holt and live to boast it no mister you've got to die and you may get yourself ready for it so soon you like coward indeed i repeat it your act is cowardly what act your unprovoked attack upon me especially since it gives you the first shot what if i were to shoot you down now with the pistol you see in my holster here i could send six bullets through your body before you could bring your rifle to your shoulder what would you call that sheer cowardice would it not be 
and murder too end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty three a duel without seconds while i was speaking i saw a change pass over the countenance of my gigantic antagonist as if some new resolve was forming in his mind that affected the programme he had already traced out was it possible i had touched him on a point of honour it was this purpose i desired to effect and though hopeless it might appear i continued the only kind of appeal that with such a spirit seemed to promise any chance of success you dare not play fair in this game i said banteringly you are a coward and would murder me you went the first shot you know you do it's a lie cried the colossus raising himself to his full height and assuming an air of chivalric grandeur i could not have deemed him capable of it's a lie i don't wish to murder you and i don't want the first shot neither how i ain't so little confidence in my shooting as to care for you and your jim crack gun nor is hick holt in such conceit with his life either that he's afeard to risk it do i air a stuck-up critter i won't give you the opportunity to accuse me of foul play there's grit in you i reckon in seeing that's made me change my mind what i exclaimed taken by surprise at the speech and fancying it promised an end to our altercation you have changed your mind you mean to act justly then i mean it shall be a fair stand-up fight atween us oh a duel duel or whatever else you may call it mister i agree to that but how about seconds do you think two men can fight fair without seconds you see yonder stump a standing nigh the bars yes i see it well mister there you'll take your stand ahind or a front of it which so ever you like best Hars this i run close by the crib there'll be my place there's twenty yards atween em i reckon is that your distance it will do as well as any other i replied mechanically still under the influence of surprise not unmingled with a sentiment of admiration dismount then take your pouch and flask along with you you see i've got mine one shot at ya all's i want i reckon but if there should be a miss look out for a quick load and mind mr lurs one of us never leaving this clarn alive about the first shot who is to give the signal i thought of that away it'll be all right promise you in what way can you arrange it this way dar's a hunk o deer meat in the house i mean to fetch that out and chuck it over there in the middle of clearing see them buzzards up there on the dead woods I nodded in the affirmative. Well, it won't be long afore one or other em flops down on the meat, and first of that touches a gun will be a signal. Well, fair enough, I reckon. Perfectly fair, I replied, still speaking mechanically, for the very justness of the proposal rendered my astonishment continuous. I was something more than astonished at the altered demeanour of the man. He was fast disarming me. His unexpected behaviour had subdued my ire and all consideration of consequences apart i now felt a complete disinclination for the combat was it too late to stay our idle strife such was my reflection the moment after and with an effort conquering my pride i gave words to the thought you're too late mister don't do now was the reply to my pacific speech and why not i continued to urge though to my chagrin i began to perceive that it was an idle effort yever is my dander and by god you've got to fight for it but surely stop your palaver by that eternal earthquake i begin to think you're a coward i thought you'd show a white feather a fort you are all over enough cried i stung by the taunt i'm ready for you one way or the other go on the squatter once more entered his cabin and soon came out again bringing forth the piece of venison now cried he to your stand i remember neither fires till the bird lights on the ground or her that you may go it like blazes stay said i there is something yet to be done you are acting honourably in this affair which i acknowledge is more than i was led to expect you deserve one chance for your life and if i should fall it will be in danger 
you would be regarded as a murderer that must not be what is it you mean hurriedly interrogated my antagonist evidently not comprehending my words without answering to the interrogatory i drew out my pocket-book and turning to a blank leaf of the memorandum wrote upon it i have fallen in a fair fight i appended the date signed by name and tearing out the leaf handed it to my adversary he looked at it for a moment as if puzzled to make out what was meant he soon saw the intention however as i could tell by his grim smile you're right thar said he in a drawling tone and after a pause i hedn't talk o that i guess this document'll be nothin to wish o my name too what sauce for the goose here like what sauce for the gander your pencil if ye please i ain't much a scholar but i reckon i can write my name har goes spreading out the paper on top of a stump he slowly scribbled his name below mine and then holding the leaf before my eyes pointed to the signature but without saying a word this done he replaced the document on the stump and drawing his knife stuck the blade through the paper and left the weapon quivering in the wood all these manoeuvres were gone through with as cool composure as if they were only the prelude to some ordinary purpose i reckon stringer said he in the same imperturbable tone that'll keep the wind from blowing it away till we've settled who it's to belong to now to your place i'm a-gwan to throw the dear me i had already dismounted and stood near him rifle in hand unresistingly i obeyed the request and walked off to the stump that had been designated without saying another word or even looking around i had no apprehension of being shot in the back for the late behaviour of the man had completely disarmed me of all suspicion of treachery i had not the slightest fear of his proving a traitor and no more did i hold him to be a coward that impression was gone long ago i confess that never with more reluctance did i enter upon the field of fight and at that moment had my antagonist required it i should not only have retracted the allegation of cowardice but perhaps have surrendered up my claim to the clearing though i knew this could be done only at the expense of my name and honour were i to have done so i could never have shown my face again neither in the settlement of swampville nor elsewhere even among my polished friends of more fashionable circles i should have been taunted branded as a coward in a poltroon the rude character of my adversary would have been no excuse especially after the manner in which he was acting backed out would have been the universal verdict moreover notwithstanding the apparently calm demeanour the squatter had now assumed courteous i might almost call it i knew he was implacable in his determination there was no alternative i must fight i arrived at the stump and turning on my heel stood facing him he was already in his place with the joint of venison in one hand and his long rifle in the other the moment was nigh when one of us should make an abrupt exit from the world such a destiny for one or other of us i saw depicted in the impassable face of my adversary as plainly as if written upon the sky i could read there that there was no chance of escaping the combat and i resigned myself to meet it no mister cried my antagonist in a clear firm voice i'm a-gwan to chuck the meat remember nayther's to fire till a bird lights on a ground arter that you may go it like hell i saw him swing the joint once or twice around his head i saw it jerked aloft and then whirling through the air i saw it falling falling till a sodden sound told that it had reached the ground it was a fearful moment End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty four waiting the word in truth was it a fearful moment one to shake the steadiest nerves or thrill the stoutest heart to me it was an ordeal far more terrible than that of an ordinary duel for there was lacking the motive at least on my side which usually stimulates to an affair of honour sense of wrong i felt but too slightly for revenge not enough to steal the heart to the spilling of blood anger i had felt but the moment before and then i could have fought even to the death but my blood that had boiled up for an instant now ran coldly through my veins the unexpected behaviour of my adversary had calmed my wrath acting upon it like oil upon troubled water thus to fight without seconds to die without friend to speak the last word of worldly adieu 
or take the life of another without human being to attest the fairness of the act no earthly eye beholding us no living creature save the black vultures appropriate instruments to give the death signal ominous witnesses of the dark deed such were the appalling reflections that came before my mind as i stood facing my determined antagonist it would scarcely be true to say that i felt not fear and yet it was less cowardice than a sort of vague vexation at risking my life in so causeless a conflict there was something absolutely ludicrous in standing up to be shot at merely to square with the whim of this eccentric squatter and to shoot at him seemed equally ridiculous either alternative upon reflection appeared the very essence of absurdity and having ample time to reflect while awaiting the signal i could not help thinking how farcical was the whole affair no doubt i might have laughed at it had i been a mere looker-on herald or spectator but unfortunately being a principal in this deadly duello a real wrestler in the backwoods arena the provocative to mirth was given in vain and only served to heighten the solemnity of the situation the circumstances might have elicited laughter but the contingency turn whatever way it might was too serious to admit of levity on my part either horn of the dilemma presented a sharp point to suffer one's self to be killed in this sans facon was little else than suicide while to kill smacked strongly of murder and one or the other was the probable issue nay more than probable for as i bent my eyes on the resolute countenance of my vis-a-vis -vis, i felt certain that there was no chance of escaping from the terrible alternative he stood perfectly immobile his long rifle raised to the ready with its muzzle pointing towards me and in his eye could not read the slightest sign that he wavered in his determination that grey-green orb was the only member that moved his body limbs and features were still and rigid as the stump behind which he stood the eye alone showed signs of life i could see its glance directed toward three points in such rapid succession that it might be said to look three ways at once to the decoy upon the ground to the shadowy forms upon the tree and towards myself its chief object of surveillance merciful heavens is there no means to avert this doom of dread is it an absolute necessity that i must kill either this colossus or be myself slain is there no alternative is there still no chance of an arrangement hopeless as it appeared i resolved to make a last effort for peace once more i should try the force of an appeal if he refused to assent to it my position would be no worse better indeed since i stood in need of some stimulus to arouse me to an attitude even of defence this thought swaying me i called out halt you are a brave man i know it why should this go on is it not too late you are a coward cried he interrupting me and i know it a sneaking coward in spite of your sort of clothes shit up your darned head or you'll scare away the birds and by the eternal infant you do i fire at you the first that takes wing let that be the signal then cried i roused to an impatient indignation by this new insult the first that takes wing agreed was a quick rejoinder delivered in a tone that bespoke determination to abide by it my irresolution troubled me no longer thus driven to bay i felt that further forbearance would not only be idle but dangerous it was plain with my life to leave it in the hands of this unrelenting enemy better make him suffer for his sanguinary folly than be myself its victim stirred by these thoughts i grasped my rifle now for the first time with a determination to make use of it by the same prompting my eye became active watching with resolute regard the movements of the birds and measuring the ground that separated me from my adversary notwithstanding the sting which his words had inflicted i was yet hampered by some considerations of mercy i had no desire to kill the man if i could avoid it to cripple him would be sufficient i had no fear of his having the shot before me long practice had given me such adroitness in the use of my weapon that i could handle it with the quickness and skill of a juggler neither did i fear to miss my aim i had perfect reliance on the sureness of my sight and with such a mark as the huge body of the squatter it was impossible i could miss in this respect the advantage was mine and at so short a distance i could have ensured a fatal shot had such been my intention but it was not the very contrary was my wish to draw blood without inflicting a mortal wound this would perhaps satisfy the honour of my antagonist and bring our strife to an end whether any such consideration was in his mind i could not tell it was not visible in his eye nor in his features that throughout the whole scene 
preserved their stern statue-like rigidity there was no help for it no alternative but to shoot at him and shoot him down if possible only to wing him but of course a sense of my own danger rendered this last of less than secondary importance a single exchange of shots would no doubt decide the affair and the advantage would fall to him who was quickest on the trigger to obtain this advantage then i watched with eager eye the behaviour of the birds in like manner was my antagonist occupied End of chapter twenty four